She said that that's a wonderful uh, merit that you all have um, to be connected to such a wonderful mama and um so she said that just before that, you know, it's, it's a wonderful merit that you all have to be connected to a Lama like Sophie Rinpoche mm. and to be, you know, engaging in his activities in all the ways that you do. And it's a, a wonderful merit. It's all very, very precious. And she said just now um, that the, uh, you know, the Buddhist teachings are the principal source and potential for actual peace and happiness in the world. If you really look deeply into what peace and happiness is, what other source can truly provide it, uh, you know, apart from these teachings of Pudhichungwa, um, sort of like exceptional uh, insight and exceptional compassion. Those are the hallmarks of the Buddhist teachings, exceptional insight and exceptional compassion, because those are the hallmarks of the Buddhist teachings. They provide a unique possibility for happiness and peace to emerge in the world. Tell then, <laughs> 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 So, she said that, uh, you know, uh, the teachings of Sutra and Tantra came to Tibet. And uh, these two streams, you know, came to Tibet and survived in Tibet, which is, which is un unusual uh, for such a long, long period of time. And she said, kind of culminated in His Holiness. And then, due to circumstances, His Holiness had to leave Tibet and settled in India. And through His Holiness's um, vision and kindness, you know, the whole world, through especially dialogues with science, has been uh, connecting to His Holiness. Because at the end of the day, science and the Dharma want kind of the same thing. Um, which is to understand the way things truly are. What is the actual basic reality? Um, because science, that's what science ultimately wants. And that's what the Buddha Dharma is ultimately about, discovering the truth of the matter. And through His Holiness's vision and kindness, all of these dialogues with scientists over the years um, have created an atmosphere where all of these very respected, uh, amazing scientists come and meet with His Holiness and engage their ways and points of view with the Buddhist ways and points of view. And, th you know, through that now, 
many uh, leading scientists really understand the value of the Buddhist uh, approach to um, discovering the way things truly are. And more and more, the scientists have uh, coming to the conclusion that, you know, their way of understanding fundamental reality is very much aligned with the Buddhist way of understanding the fundamental reality. So all of this uh, has come about, this beautiful uh, interdependence of science and Buddhism has come about due to His Holiness's connection with the scientific world. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> she also said before um, that uh, the um, you guys, in addition to kind of you know being connected to that from that whole world, have clearly decided to rely on good lamas and receive pith instructions from our traditions of good lamas, and so that's an amazing situation to be able to rely on and receive pith instructions from such good lamas. So that's, she's sort of rejoicing in that situation. And she said, uh, and so all these different lamas from many traditions and different scientific points of view in an unbiased and non-sectarian way gather with His Holiness for this sharing of ideas. And then she said, you know, perhaps that was something that you <laughs> maybe <laughs> ケツ<笑><笑> Similarly, <laughs> Don't <laughs> 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 So this uh, meeting uh, of different points of view, sort of like uh, the study of, of material, material reality and material world, and Simkong, Simkong Rikpa, sort of like the study of the fundamental mind and consciousness, as these two basic perspectives are meeting. Those who fundamentally study, you know, matter, the material aspect of reality, and those who study the consciousness or mind aspect of reality. And she said, uh, and this dialogue is so important uh, because um, on the side of the uh, study of material reality, matter, you might say, um, what incredible advancements have taken place. You know, it's, it's extraordinary what the, uh, those science side who have studied this stuff have produced. It's, it's amazing. Look at all the extraordinary things our world now is capable of through that study. And of course, a lot of destructive potential comes from that study as well. Possibility to destroy a lot of things. And then on the other side, the sort of study of um, mind or consciousness, she said, it's also extraordinary because through the study of mind and consciousness, um, one can uh, arrive at this exceptional insight, 
exceptional prajna, the kind of insight and compassion that you cannot find elsewhere. And through that, uh, through that sort of field of study, this, the study and practice of the mind, you can clearly understand <clears throat> what suffering is and how to completely eliminate suffering. And you can discover what happiness actually is, true, lasting happiness and joy is, and take it to um, levels unseen in any other realm, beyond what we can imagine, the kind of happiness and joy that are possible when one truly learns how to abandon the causes of suffering and accomplish the causes of happiness and take that all the way. And so uh, understanding from the perspective of studying the mind how you know, visual, form, sound, smells, tastes, and sensations, how they function, how the mind relates to them. It either causes suffering from them or creates the causes of happiness from them. So that leads to an extraordinary, mind-blowing um, achievements in mind are possible through that angle and type of study. Um, Again, exceptional insight and exceptional compassion are possible through the study and practice of the mind. Marilla said it's such an uh, outrageous thing if we really think about it. On um, the one angle, the very physical body that we have, what is it the product of? The three poisons? <laughs> How did we get this body, this defiled physical aggregate from the three poisons? And yet, at the very same time, it's this defiled physical aggregate created by the three poisons that uh, can completely accomplish the causes of happiness, completely abandon causes of suffering, achieve liberation, and even achieve omniscience based on having this body. So those things are both true at the same time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and then the same mind that we have, the same mind, you know, can constantly create. How many problems do we have on account of our mind? How many emotions? How much suffering? How much, uh, you know, reactivity? Uh, re reacting with attachment and aversion, creating endless problems for ourselves in our life. How much of that is there? That's also part of the reality. And at the very same time, within that mind, there's this way. If the mind is kind of completely authentic and pointed in the right direction with this extraordinary skillful means of bodhicitta and emptiness can completely transcend all those problems can completely, you know, totally transcend all of that with bodhicitta and emptiness. How amazing is that? How amazing is the skillful means of bodhicitta and emptiness? Extraordinary. Tangle 
However, uh, not seeing that, not seeing those authentic avenues out of our condition, what do we have? We have our current condition, endless kind of delusion and confusion. It's how amazing, how mind-boggling that if we see it, uh, there's this amazing way which unlimited benefits. And if we don't see it, it's like we're totally deluded. How extraordinary is that? She said, you know, nowadays in, in the world, uh, uh, there's all of this uh, amazing sort of uh, the bounty of the bounty of samsara, you could say, the bounty of existence, CP Punzol. And uh, that bounty, uh, it's amazing, you know, there's a lot of like pleasures and comforts to be had, but it's always limited. It's always limited. And this other way, this sort of, uh, if we direct the mind towards, you know, the extraordinary true nature of phenomena, the extraordinary true nature of the mind, the happiness and sort of uh, blessings that can come from that are totally limitless. Limitless. So she's like, you have limited <laughs> happiness. She can never transcend it's what it is. No matter how much bounty can be had, it's always limited and can never go beyond being limited. And then you have this limitless bounty to be had from exploring the nature of reality and exploring the nature of the mind. He said how extraordinary that is, that you have that. And yet, if we don't see, if we don't see it, we're just deluded. It's right there to be seen, and we don't see it, and so we're deluded. And if you see it, the benefits are totally limitless. How extraordinary is that? Think about the world as as a large, you know, what 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 could produce peace and, and happiness and benefit in the world. It's very much this, you know, and, uh, you know, this sort of uh, exceptional compassion that can come, like, from this path, the exceptional wisdom and exceptional compassion that can come from seeing things in this way really have a potential to bring, unleash peace and happiness uh, in this world. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> said, I'm just, you know, just chatting. <laughs> sort of like babbling around. <laughs> so, Where are you from? Uh, California, uh, the United States. Oh. Near the retreat center. Oh, okay. 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 See you the next time you come to California. They do, Jedi. Yes. Kung lopta chimogi gigenchi. Ah, you get into that lopta chimogi gigenda. Tini da jungzimba da. Tini menganda. Da de de zu de da. Karzoro da gigenchi buri zambuli na mune chane lopta. Tini gigenda. Then, Jungzimba. 
I told her that you were a professor. Oh. And she said that professors, and business leaders, and doctors, and politicians, and students, and stuff, it's like they have a great responsibility. And uh, because the, to bring peace and benefit into the world a little bit kind of in their hands. They mm. have the tools, they have the responsibility mm. to do so it's really wonderful uh, in this life to you know study, develop the knowledge, skills to the degree to be in a position like a professor, where you, you know, she said it's kind of like being a lama. Your kind of job is to uh, eliminate the darkness of ignorance in your students and benefit them. And that's a little bit similar to the job of a lama. So she said it's a very kind thing to have taken that path in life, that responsibility. So she said, it's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. She said, she said, I don't use the word Lama casually either. In my opinion, Lama, what, what, what a Lama really means is somebody that is actually actively <clears throat> working to dispel the suffering in other beings' minds. I don't particularly place any importance on reputation or name or status or anything like that. That's not what really makes a Lama. It's the ability to share like undefiled insight and dispel suffering uh, of other beings. That's what a Lama really is. And, um, and she said, you know, clarifying what is plain to see, what is readily apparent for like their students and what is hidden the hidden aspects of reality and what is readily apparent about reality, you know, teaching those clearly. Um, and so that really is the, what a lama really needs to uh, be doing. Uh, oh, are you right? You're so American. Yes. Yeah. Sama <laughs> We're all Americans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you uh, are involved in this whole science and Buddhism thing, she must recognize you from this. Rejoice in your work to bring that precious science and the precious dharma. <laughs> she said, if the famous scientists uh, come to get interested in the dharma, then uh, it's like the best thing that can happen to the lamas in terms of spreading the dharma. <laughs> <laughs> she said that uh, the um, the scientific approach 
which studies like uh, reality from their angle it gets very very fine and discovers all of these amazing things about how, what the brain is and how it works and all these different dimensions of studying reality intersecting with the sort of buddhist approach which studies you know coarse and very subtle aspects of mind and consciousness getting more and more and more subtle and subtle and subtle and discovering these amazing truths about the coarse and subtle dimensions of mind and so therefore the combination of like the study of matter and the exploration of mind in dialogue can really reveal so much about how reality is uh, and so that she said that's a very important and precious um, endeavor <laughs> Mishito <laughs> 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 she said uh, because this dialogue is so important, the meeting is so important because on the one hand, like the scientist's uh, approach is so, uh, you know, goes quite deep and they know so much, it's so precise and getting more subtle about like how the brain works, for example, or how visual perception or visual consciousness works from the scientific point of view. And that's amazing that they can understand it so well. But <laughs> if that's what they think consciousness is, <laughs> that's as far as they can go. They don't know what's beyond that. Like this, And she said, actually, from the point of view of Yeshe or, you know, primordial wisdom, kind of uh, the true na underlying nature of the mind, that level of consciousness, which they're now sort of studying and mapping out, is super coarse. <laughs> and there's so many subtle <laughs> levels between like basic visual consciousness and primordial wisdom. There's so many levels of subtlety and depth between that, and they don't know anything beyond basic sense consciousness. And it's amazing that they know how the brain works to that degree. But if people were to think, these, that's the story of the mind, that's as far as we can go, and they stop there, she said, what a shame that would be. In fact, that is, would, it's almost like, a, it's a huge shame. And she said, and yet there's so many subtle, 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 subtle layers of, of wisdom and, uh, and, and experience, actual direct experience that people can have between coarse sense consciousness and this primordial wisdom nature. For example, look at the difference between our waking and sleeping consciousness. It's more subtle, fall asleep. Then you enter the dream realm. Yet again, it can go more subtle. And then between even the dreaming realm and the fundamental nature, which is just luminosity, there's all these le levels of subtlety and experience. It gets more and more and more and more and more subtle. That can all be experienced. It can all is part of the reality of the mind. So if people could come to accept that and understand that, you know, like from the science side, how wonderful that would be. Otherwise, if they just stop at the level of coarse sense consciousness, what a shame. Yes, I'm busy. Better, you know? That's a 
she said from uh, from my point of view you know you think about kind of the the scientific approach what do they use they use like uh you know light you know sort of like yeah like light basically through microscopes and um, electricity and so on to study smaller and smaller and smaller particles uh, to understand what things fundamentally are and she said so where does that end up it ends up on like the, this is term in the Tibetan philosophy in um, indivisible particles like the smallest building blocks of reality we would call them subatomic particles or something and uh, and then those you know you could conceptually describe like different elements of them you know the aspect of heat or the aspect of movement and so on like they you know you could describe them in terms of the five elements and so on but she said you know that's kind of what how they are how they explore um, and she said but if we think if we take a step back and then they think they're getting to the raw underlying reality of you know mind brain or reality but she said, all of that only is exploring the confused mind. It never, <laughs> never goes beyond the confused mind. Even when they go to the fundamental subatomic reality of that, it still doesn't touch like the wisdom mind. That aspect, it's, it's inaccessible by that method or approach. <laughs> Dunny <laughs> 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 Chickens <laughs> 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 だ、ディナね、タパラヤタン。ドンエメビゲ、エネシラプラヤディ、トンシラカブレドワ。ドワ。コランコランデラ、ソロバツイタン。タパタイイチラディテナ、モンディマインバ。コランコランウエネチュガ
impure perception and confused appearances to appear when that transformation occurs within the mind as pure appearances and pure perceptions. Just like that. It's completely amazing. How could they possibly understand that? It's extremely difficult to understand that. And so it's why this dialogue is so essential because the understandings that come from this Buddhist perspective that explores the mind from the inside experientially through practice and experience can lead there. That can be understood if one has like goes through experience. But just looking at it from the outside, you can't, it, it's almost inaccessible. Um, she said they understand that everything, matter is, comes down to indivisible particles. Science has already agreed with that. that they're already there. They know that it's, you can't find concreteness within matter if you break it down and break it down into its fundamental particles. Uh, they know that, but they don't know that from the mind side how to understand the distinction between a confused mind and an unconfused mind because they don't explore it experientially. So even though they understand that from the outside about that nature of reality, that understanding is still arising in a confused mind. And so to understand beyond that, uh, it, it has to go through the avenue of experience and practice. And so that's why the dialogue of these two kind of fields of knowledge, of mind and of uh, material reality, need to cooperate to really benefit the world. Both are necessary. <laughs> ね。もう勘に読んじゃうね、ちんが。あ、ちぎ。たち、え、やつ。そばてわだ。そばとねじ。何しら、となしらめびまね。あんちゅう。たつあちんぼれ。え、たしやたん。てわたまよわしゅ
<laughs> she said, uh, from her point of view, there's two uh, <laughs> two ways that um, blind faith can operate. One uh, avenue that is uh, we could call blind faith is uh, sort of like, um, you know, I don't understand what the causes and conditions are for happiness and suffering. I don't understand what causes and conditions produce happiness. I don't understand what causes and conditions produce suffering. But please help me to have no suffering. Please, ha please help me to be happy. Just asking for it to somehow magically appear from outside. And then you ask, what are the causes and conditions of happiness? What are the causes and conditions of suffering? Why do you like happiness? Why do you not want to suffer? How does that work? What is the the, co the interdependence? How does it function? No answer. No idea. But please help me again and again. Please, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. Please help me be happy. No understanding of how what the causality is with happiness and suffering. So that's one kind of blind faith. There's another kind of blind faith, which is uh, unless I can see it, doesn't exist. Yeah. I can't see it myself do, does not exist. That's also a dangerous kind of blind faith. You know, I look and look and look, but if it's something I cannot see myself and verify myself, my own senses doesn't exist. Totally deny it, reject it. That actually is also a different kind of blind faith and both are very dangerous. And so understanding the, um, the way that uh, you know interdependence works is so crucial. If you don't understand interdependence and how happiness is a result of s gathering certain causes and conditions together, it's just the result. And if you and suffering is the same. Certain causes and conditions gather, suffering results. And those do not gather, suffering does not result. Not understanding that and just asking for it to mysteriously go away or someone else to make it go away doesn't work. That's a, that's a dangerous kind of blind faith because it's not grounded in understanding. And so, not falling into those two kinds of blind faith, but rather, to use Buddhist terms, understanding the way the ground is, the way the fruition is, and the way the path is. These are Buddhist terminologies, she said. And we can understand how, how exceptional compassion and exceptional insight can bring about the qualities of the fruition, something that we can directly experience within ourselves and put into practice. And so when you really see reality in that way, like from the avenue of understanding it, but also experiencing it and practicing it, then it's like you see the reality and you have no, um, there's no doubt in a healthy way. Yeah. You can confirm it yourself and then you avoid these two pitfalls of these two kinds of blind faith. <laughs> she said, she said, I'm just babbling the way I think. Just some thoughts bubbling up in my mind. <laughs> she said, you guys are so, you know, wise and learned. She said, you know, I'm just wasting your time here, just babbling on about my random thoughts. <laughs> Yeah. Her insight is so precise and so accurate for exactly what um, is the situation with, let's say, mind and life, that um, it would be so powerful if Kanjula wouldn't mind it, maybe giving us some tactical advice, because everything she said is exactly, exactly right. And as you know, we have the, the, the messy business. Mm -hmm of how mm -hmm. to go about mm -hmm. creating the causes and conditions mm -hmm. that will allow for this current mm -hmm. circumstance to grow mm -hmm. as opposed to shrink mm -hmm. and and hopefully grow quickly. Mm -hmm. So I do, and then I'll just tie, maybe that's the first question. I think maybe, maybe that yeah. might be a good place to 
to keep it. Um, mind and lives. Oh, did you mind? Yeah. Yeah. Mind and life, the Maomba ge ra di inang shuda sendiri ra jebati. Ani kandres pegre kain sana kuzo shitan deng san di odds masel pa chaso. Ani nyok tro kashi chaso di 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 chola droho inanda chok shinda la droho inanda kandre Maomba la peya dan deng san ni kisi ani kandre la la. Kitchen, any Gudaki, Ra Pentoyagi, Gudaki, Zomba Latine, any Petuna, any Digi Cola, should be yours. Cody, she said this 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 like stepping back you know this overall uh purpose of bringing together uh, buddhist uh, fields of knowledge and scientific experts to dialogue and discuss the points at which they maybe, you know, see things the same way or different ways and kind of basically like bringing their respective fields of knowledge into dialogue with each other. She said it's a very important thing, actually. It's a very important thing. Zambalinki <laughs> ハトクソンテバメツジェソンセンティチラ Ideas. Oh, okay. Um, so she said, um, after saying it's so important that this, these two fields of knowledge come together, she said, and, however, I do have a few opinions. <laughs> and she said, I've, I've seen a little bit of these mind and life uh, <laughs> gatherings, a little bit. She said, I've gone to, I've seen a few. Um, she said, um, one thing that, uh, you know, she said, just from my opinion, is that, um, you know, these, you are bringing, you know, bringing together, all, uh, inviting all of these experts in various fields of knowledge, you know, to the gathering, and then bringing various sort of Buddhist experts together. So that is kind of the basic framework. And then she said, you have His Holiness, you know, uh, there. And she said, but I feel that, uh, she said, I feel sometimes it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable because it's almost like, and please help me if I get this uh, precise the way she said it, but it's uh, sort of like, um, and so of course there's a lot of benefits through interacting with each other. But she said before, it's sort of like His Holiness sometimes seems like he can, you know, or the way it's set up, it's like he can 
asking them, these two sides, to sort of find agreement or common ground. Rattamba. But his own, like, really, what he sees with his kind of, like, extraordinary wisdom, love, and power, uh, and which could benefit the whole world, to, to, to really say that from his side, maybe, it seems a little uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> so she said, um, so uh, this, for sure, like the discoveries and knowledge held by uh, the scientific, more material approach has a lot that can benefit the uh, those who follow like the science of the mind, she's sort of saying, is in terms of like the inner science or Buddhist science. She calls it the science of the mind and then science of matter or material things. For sure, the, the, from the perspective of what the science of material things has learned can benefit those of us who primary approach is the science of the mind. And for sure, the experience, the knowledge, the experiential knowledge and wisdom that science of the mind people, practitioner or Buddhist scholars can offer back to um, the more hard or traditional sciences, for sure that's also very beneficial ideas some things she said but one sort of uh, obstacle is that in the same person it's very very rare that they actually like you're either on one side or you're on the other side and so then uh, she said in one person being able to truly understand these two perspectives in the same mind is very very rare so that's one obstacle <laughs> だ、セムカムリバルオディリシナニナスズアニチタスセムチャモギニトミタテワライアタンタシエバタチレバラマンディリシェビニチュカニシエンジュティナラアニコラカジュゴロチペチャナラヨワザンギマシデナディグマラペ
<laughs> she said, um, especially, uh, she said a few things before I, I missed, which I just remembered. Um, you know, she said, like, um, the, uh, specifically, she referenced, like, aspects of mind that do not depend on the brain before so in regard to like leading having the experience and teaching it from through experience and then she reiter- reiterated that just now when she said uh, that um so when you talk about uh, like shepa like cognizance or consciousness or knowingness she said um there's many different dimensions of that fundamentally the essence of cognizance has no shape no color and no form it's beyond that. She said, but of course, there's many coarse and subtle levels of like consciousness or cognizance. And so some of, and they each have their own like um, support. Um, you know, uh, they each reside some on something or somewhere kind of. So she said, for example, some aspects of cognizance uh, rely on the brain as a support for their function. And other more subtle aspects of consciousness or cognizance rely on other things and other places and things. And so um, those, you know, to, to go to explore those experientially would be an extremely uh, important way that these sort of traditions could bring benefit into the world because uh, going that route experientially exploring consciousness from coarse to subtle levels along with one's own experience can then really bring peace and happiness into the world because it's it's really profound um, if you don't do that however then you can have a situation where you know you have the materialists over here and the people who talk about mind being primary over there i think like this and you think like that and they, and they start to quarrel and disagree and bash heads against each other. And she said, not only will that not bring benefit, it actually can bring harm. And harm both of them, actually. So, Sheba, you need to understand that. 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 You need Jungsadia, <laughs> Mm. Mm. Um, it's like uh, the Mambala element, で、で、だ。ジュルジャンプ。これ、ケチケチがてげるまで。さまじすじ。ケチケチがて。ちでろ。あなやん。ロトンダチジェラカリユメでハコまれ。いなやシェベニツンがね。おう、ロ。ジャ
Yeah, she said, for example, uh, she said, you know, everything in this world is composed by like the basic five elements and uh, combinations of the five elements coming together, you know, fire and water and space and uh, wind and so on. And, uh, and she said, and earth. And these qualities coming together form everything, form our entire earth, form uh, our bodies, form everything. And where do these five elements come from? They come out of basic space. And where do they dissolve back into? Back into basic space. So that's one thing. And she said, for example, you know, let's think about a um, thousand years into the future. She said, um, it's basically impossible from, the, um, from a scientific point of view that's looking at material reality and because it's constantly changing for us to know what could possibly happen a thousand years from now. But mind, pure mind, which is not uh, totally constrained or actually even relies on physical reality, um, with its own investigation, could perhaps see and know what might happen a thousand years uh, from now, just in the mind. But if you try to look at, analyze material reality and figure that out, it's completely impossible because every physical substance is momentarily changing every single moment. So how could you possibly know what might occur if you look at it from that angle in a thousand years? But in the mind, because the mind is not constrained by that pure cognizance, pure mind, through its own kind of investigation or seeing, could perhaps know something like that. And then, uh, so that's an example of, you know, and, and furthermore, uh, you know, the different aspects of within mind, one can see, for example, that the five elements gather together to form this earth, which is sort of like one of our homes. And then within that the sort of country, the place that we live, that's another kind of home. Then we go more, look more inside the body is like a gathering of just the gathering of the elements that supports sort of consciousness or cognizance. Then we go even inside the body and the brain is kind of like a, a seat and an area that supports a certain kinds of consciousness, like the sense consciousnesses and so on. Then you can go more subtle than that, go into mind consciousness, go into subtle ex the consciousness of subtle experience. And that has its own like domain, its own home or support. And then we go more and more and more and more and more and more and more subtle. Keeps getting more and more subtle. So the knowledge of that, the ability to see that and understand that and all of those different coarse and subtle aspects of consciousness is what like uh, the science of the mind or what the Buddhist experiential mind science can bring to the table. And that is uh, completely, uh, it's kind of inaccessible to people who look at things as just material, you know, momentarily changing material substance. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Kunzo 
Lady, you be Tony. So what they want, Baji Tony, then Guns of Dila, Namjur, Mrs. Chaldo. Guns of Chick Shadow, Tony, Tony Janja, Truby, Guns of Tony Janja Shadow, so what it to me, so what to me. And you take it, Chabang, you load it, Koran, you share a dee, you share a pity, you want to take a person, then Guns of Dia Young. Then so what they want, Baji. Right. <laughs> 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 <laughs
coming together, a lot of good things uh, are possible if you know they can um, dialogue and benefit each other in productive ways. So the uh, um, yeah, so the, um, the there's great benefits to be had by this dialogue, bringing these different uh, fields of knowledge together. You know, they both have important things to offer. I mean, look what uh, you know. The for example, from the side of, of study of material reality, look at what incredible things they've discovered about health about how to improve, how to restore uh, human health. And um, those would really help us. <laughs> we need those things, you know, and to, to benefit our, for, this is just an example, to benefit our kind of world and, and ways. If those, that kind of knowledge to, to sustain and, you know, how to maintain and sustain our body's physical health, us in the kind of, that world really could benefit from that. Um, and we have a lot that can benefit them. And so, you know, the dialogue is, is so important to share what we have that's of value and, um, yeah, to benefit each other. <laughs> she said um, something really important before. Uh, she said something about that uh, feeling, sensation and feeling should be a point of, 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 of where the dialogue comes together, mm -hmm. dialogue between uh, sort of material science and mind science, of the Buddhist science, comes together. Because she said, that's where like the rubber hits the road with happiness and suffering, mm -hmm. the level of our felt experience, sensations and feelings. And that, therefore, they should, that should be the point where they kind of converge and discuss their understandings, because then it can really be grounded um, in terms of a constructive dialogue, mm. the level of feelings and sensations where pleasure and pain actually are experienced. So that's where, you know, the Buddhist science and the um, material science should go there. That should be like the focal point of their, of their dialogues. So that, that way they can, yeah, felt sense, sensations and feelings, because then they can really, it can get more, it can see each other's practical consequences. Um, and then she said just now, for example, like, you know, if you think about just the experience of perceiving this flower, you know, the flower has aspects of like color, shape and form, and the material scientists can study that and learn a lot about it. The color and the qualities and the characteristics and the form, the shape and so on, all these different aspects of the material reality of the flower. And then also, What's in terms of our experience of the flower, flower appears to us as like a mental image in our consciousness. And that, the uh, mind, science of the mind, or the Buddhist science, understands a lot about how that works. 
and what the nature of that is. How, you know, something with color and shape and form can have a mental image in mind which fundamentally doesn't have color and shape and form and so on. That's the domain of, you know, knowledge that the sort of mind science or Buddhist science brings. And those two need to talk to each other. <laughs> For example, <laughs> he said, uh, <laughs> is, uh, For example, the Heart Sutra. What does the Heart Sutra say? Form is emptiness. He said, Scientists have got there. They get that. They, they, they understand that. But what comes after that? Emptiness is form. Ask a scientist how emptiness is form. What are they going to say? I don't know. What do you say about that? Mm. Mm. She said, it's really great, this, um, this uh, it's so precious and important to kind of study things from different points of view. And she said, you know, from one side, this kind of scientific uh, way of like, until I see the reality of something, you know, I won't accept it. She said, that's also good. We, you know, that's fine. We should want to see the reality of something before we accept it. That's also good. <laughs> but we think about what is the, you know, what is the true reality of things. We could also divide it from one angle into two aspects. The fundamental reality of objects and the fundamental reality of the observer or the subject. Those both have their own fundamental realities. Mm. <laughs> so, so, for example, uh, if you think about the approach of exploring the fundamental nature of uh, apparent or objective or apparent reality, reality of appearances, then it's all about studying interdependence, understanding in greater and greater precision and complexity how causes and conditions produce these objects that we perceive. And that is, that does, it is the study of how they are, of their reality. And that's important, that's valuable. Understanding the causes and conditions, the interdependence that defines the reality of appearances, of conventional appearances. That is one thing. And of course, from the, you know, Buddhist science point of view, understanding our own body, speech, and mind, and how it's formed, and how it reacts, and how it experiences, is also very important, like understanding the subject, understanding the reality of the object, and understanding the reality of the subject. And they're both very important. Um, and, um, yeah, because the, uh, the knowing, a certain aspect of the knowingness is not confined to the sense consciousnesses. You know, where does knowing take place? It actually takes place in mental consciousness. It's not confined to, vis you know, visual consciousness or auditory consciousness or another of the sense consciousnesses. There's, a, there's 
important functions and aspects of knowing that occur in mental consciousness outside of the domain, the constraints of any of the particular senses. So how does that function? What is the nature of that? ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
Where does it all dissolve into? The mind consciousness. And the mind consciousness contains these subtle dimensions as well. Like, for example, ending up in the eighth consciousness of the Alaya Minyana, or the storehouse consciousness. Uh, and then she said, that's just, this is an example. Dreaming, the dreaming state. Uh, and the, the states of consciousness experienced in deep sleep and dreaming and so on. And she said, and in fact, many aspects of subtle, subtle perception or subtle experience, subtle vision are similar to this because it's like what exactly is producing what's experienced, you know, an aspect of the mind is being experienced, which is looking back at the mind itself, both the generator of that experience and the experiencer of that experience are the mind. And so the way that functions is really interesting and important. And both in the case of like dreams and a sleep state, which could be accessible to study by science. She said, I'm kind of surprised they haven't done that. And of course, the area of subtle perception or subtle vision and so on also kind of functions that way. She said, in, in really extraordinary and amazing ways. <laughs> Nimba <laughs> 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 Yeah, so she said, uh, um, so we think about the, uh, the physical senses all have uh, like an extent. And so the, the sort of uh, furthest extent within our sense uh, consciousness's capacity is, uh, is visual perception. You know, we can see things that we can't hear. Then a little bit, you know, much less than that is our auditory capacity, the, the extent to which we can hear sounds uh, in terms of distance. Then comes the sense of smell. We can hear things that we can't smell. We can smell things that are still uh, away from the body. It comes to like taste and physical sensations on the body until they are actually contact with the tongue or with the uh, physical body, the skin, then we can't. Uh, activate those senses and so they each have their extent and of course you know using this metaphor of dissolution that occurs into the sleeping and dreaming state and it all dissolves back into the mind consciousness which is completely um, vast and surpasses any of the sense consciousnesses in terms of its capacity and then she said uh, that's one very interesting avenue and then she said it's also like the case of dying Somebody dies, what's left over? Coarse, kind of like rotten physical flesh. Not that nice. But the consciousness departs. How does it depart? Where does it depart? In what way does it depart? That needs to be studied and understood. Or even how we come into this world. You know, basically, come into this world through the joining of sperm and egg. 
But there's also the aspect of consciousness. Is that the mother's consciousness coming in? No. Is it the father's consciousness coming in? No. Is it some like half-half coming in and joining together? No, it's not. It's something else. How does that happen? Where does that come from? That also needs to be understood and studied. It's just so many things need to be understood and studied. There's so many amazing things that need to be uncovered. So, for example, this body we have, this brain we have, you know, it clearly develops from this sort of embryo that forms from the mother and father's, you know, a sperm and egg. And so the substance itself of the brain is clearly a, a sort of developmentally connected to the embryo, which is formed by the sperm and the egg. So you could say the substance of the brain comes directly from the mother and father's substance. There's a clear line there. She said, that's, that's clear. She said, but why then, uh, same mother and father have three children? Completely different mindsets, completely different interests, completely different characters, totally different things uh, and ways of expressing themselves in their world. So, how can you explain that? It comes from the same substance. She said, there's problems with that view. <laughs> with the material view, you run into problems. Mm. <laughs> Come, Kandula said that uh, the, um, um, so uh, the problem one of the problems with just viewing everything as brain <laughs> that's coming from brain material or brain tissue uh, is she's sort of describing the limitations of that and uh, she said another problem with that perspective is the brain is subject to momentary impermanence the brain of yesterday is completely different on a fundamental level from the brain of today it's constantly changing every single moment everything is anything composed of physical matter is literally like you know subject to constant momentary impermanence so um, so there's that also so um, that is something and therefore the aspect of consciousness or mind is like it very very uh, important and um, she said something else that I'm forgetting uh, after that never 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 ね、ばいな。だ、上は、ちょ、ちょ、ちょ、ちょ、ね、ちょ、ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。
And then physical elements, uh, if you get down to it, are these fundamental kind of physical elemental building blocks of material reality. And then based on those kind of elements or potentials, capacities, you have like the fully formed uh, functioning of uh, you know, visual objects, visual perception, you know, the, the, the functions of sound and hearing and so on. It's based on the kind of elemental potentiality of the elements. That's what the brain's composed of. If you explore the brain, that's what you end up with. And all of that is momentary, subject to momentary impermanence as well. And so basically, you know, what this comes down to in terms of study, what we're really interested in the end, what affects us most, is our own experience of pleasure and pain, of happiness and suffering. Who experiences that? The mind experiences that. The experience of sensations and feelings and uh, happiness and suffering occurs in the mind. And so to understand what affects us most, we need to study the mind. And so this dialogue between material and Buddhist science should occur around this issue of experience or sensation or feeling. so many funny sort of misunderstandings. She said, for example, this whole, like, when we try to see value in things, she said one way that we sort of project value onto things is by saying, that's really old. <laughs> she said, if you think about it a while, that's incredibly stupid. <laughs> things don't have value just because they're old. Do we value, like, old, stale air? Do we value, you know, stale water and stale elements that compose them? No. Those aren't inherently valuable because they're old. We think that something's valuable just because it's old. It's like, that doesn't confer value on it. That's really funny. Oh. <laughs> the oldest thing about us is our clichés. <laughs> Does that mean that they're good because they're the oldest thing we have? If something just being old doesn't confer to mean it's valuable or good. <laughs> she said, actually, yeah. that's really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> or you can look at it from the opposite point of view and say that the truly most valuable thing uh, is the oldest thing of all, which is the luminous nature of mind, mm -hmm. which has been since beginningless time. It's always there. It's always been there from before the beginning. It's there now. It will always be there, sort of timelessly. Uh, and that is perhaps the most valuable thing that we could possibly uh, discover. Nothing that could be made in the past, nothing that can be, you know, an old thing built in the past or something we could make now or something in the future uh, could be ever be more valuable than that. And uh, it also can't be contaminated in the past, present, or future. It can't be improved upon. It can't be made. And that is uh, also like the most valuable thing. So you could also look at it that way. <laughs> 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 
Ти само ти кога дава? Джумбо е на диджи да рома. Дам ли се? In terms of the most valuable thing from the Buddhist perspective, uh, you know, it would be unsurpassable wisdom, unsurpassable love, and unsurpassable capacity, like the three qualities of enlightenment. And this uh, sort of beginningless, luminous mind, those are like the most valuable things from a Buddhist point of view. And she said, And those never get old. <laughs> Look, everyone's still interested in them. They've been around for a long time, but everyone's still interested in them. Those, don't, those never get old. So that they're, if you're really smart, if you're really smart, you'd be interested in those things. He's like, that's it. Money, Tony, Mom, Then the the sort of nice talk about the mind and life. Oh, mind and life. This would be the actual Tony, but didn't drop it. Miss it, touch it. Would it be that? One in Tony, Tangwini, Joey Gino, she passed out to Chelamatu, seven to Euro, Joey Gino, Joe Zina, one in that you, Sanji, and did over it. Now you have got a good race. My own devil, I did have a chum chum, you must be able to do it. And it's hearing that did it touch him, did it chuck. Ani mau bala dili, nunggu maris. Ada apa dili kita cuma dili. Kong bicin bala nama nindar nimba dah jawa tak yang sokong dia macam la. Ah sunyal la, macam tu jangan buat sunyal la. Dia tak cuma tu kau tu lah. Tiada apa, jawa. Macam mi zaman ni mi cintang ni mi kita macam tu dili jawa ina. Nampu mi se dili cinta sa mi se mi se bawa kau tu. ちまらんのめはなんのまめはしてさじ関西店で食うのはまずめはインザンチャーソンまで個人さじがそれで彼韓国で家内やんディギ食物いたんじゃもんじゃないですかうんだディギもねもねじゃねてだてだそうなんだ
I just remember she said just before the piece a little piece I forgot she said these days you know uh, in terms of value you know she said so many sort of important powerful wealthy people in the world you know what did they have what did they do maybe they got an airplane <laughs> maybe they have some kind of palace or an amazing place she said okay that's fine that's that's okay but you know in terms of true value like this kind of wisdom you know this sort of wisdom power and capacity that is the you know what is coming through his holiness you know and uh, the spreading of that so that's really valuable and then just now she said um you know these scientists who are involved in these kinds of dialogues they're really quite amazing you know, sort of said, danny goldman richie davidson she said there's i don't remember all their names there's one bald guy <laughs> anyway <laughs> and uh <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and you've come. Uh, <laughs> she said, I'm not educated. All I can remember is the shape of their uh, face and stuff. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, it's, and you've come and trying to help. And she said, and that's wonderful. These are really, these are good people. This is an act of kindness. She said, they're not gathering because it's going to benefit themselves. They're not coming for the food. <laughs> They're not coming for the nice place to stay. They're not coming with some sort of self-centered uh, aim or agenda to benefit their own personal sort of life. They're doing it for others. They're doing it to benefit others. And that's beautiful. And she said, that actually is the most valuable thing we have in this world is trying to benefit others. That's what's really valuable about all of this. That's what's the most valuable thing in the world. <laughs> So the most, uh, the greatest wealth, most, the most beautiful, the most, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> said the true wealth, true wealth is is benefiting others. True beauty is benefiting others. True power is all about benefiting others. Any other kind of wealth, beauty, or power, who cares? No point. That's what true wealth is. That's what true power is. That's what true beauty is. All about. All about benefiting others. Otherwise, no point. What's the use? Um, where I teach, it's very difficult for students to let go of the materialism. They think the brain is where it stops. That the eternal luminous mind is an illusion. It's, it's not real. But they have a hunger for it. They're hungry for it. So the way that I try to engage them is by thinking about love, reflecting about love, because love isn't anywhere, mm. but it's real to them. Mm. Mm. So I teach a class on love, 
And I'm surprised that many of them are afraid of love, very afraid of love, like the essence of love, the, the presence of love. There's actually a lot of fear, and I see it in myself, afraid. Mm. How do we meet our fear of love? Mm, a beautiful question. Come <laughs> Desa Gogi Mare Yitan Kado Gogi Mare Jamse Torwadi and Kozo Yan Jamse Gogedu Inea Kungi Triwat Sosana Jamse La Karisegore Shenang Is that the right way? Drangang Fear Ra Jamse La Drangang any konya some some young do any love to salaya mombo young do just some country mazo jamsela any chana mepa a chagres. Oh, she that um similar you use a letter to the data can and gallop of the shirts only the laris for the ding on that love your mumbo's go with what um that in a young kumazo. There is no chamze, much of Tandaji chamze she had it. And the shirup the chigurua. This shirup the teacher. You want the jade, you shirup the pitcher to go. This one's on chamze. She needs you lay in a good jima jigua. And jipa may be chamze to my coguna. Any tower the chinchil way. Tower that kisses you guys in a tap, they would do a tower the layata, semi rangila, the tip books, kitchen. コンコンのにつぎコンユコンユのにつコンカンやまでだろうベルジナ ダンのだ。ダンとジネ。ナムドディワンとゴロ。タ。ソウテロトツラカリン。チャンボタンシャンウイニステナパヤテレ。チゲロワ。ソソソロバザンボタ。ウイニステナパナニ。ゼワラ
I'll work backwards so I don't forget the end. Because at the end she said, um, so basically when, you, when you're dealing with students, uh, you know, relying on insight, uh, vastness of perspective and openness um, is very important. Because otherwise the mind gets tight. Mm. The mind gets claustrophobic. Mm. So it, it has to kind of be connected to insight, openness, or open-mindedness, mm. and a, 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 like opening their mind to a vaster perspective. Mm. Then they can find a kind of openness with which to relate to these things. Mm. And it doesn't get so tight and they don't feel so claustrophobic. That's what she sort of concluded with. And then... Um, uh, basically, she said, um, she said, uh, yeah, uh, uh, your question about fear of love. She said, uh, she said of course, uh, the first thing you said was about this, you know, original luminosity. She said, yeah, understanding that from the beginning is extremely difficult. Like, of course, mm -hmm. starting off with something as profound as the ground of original a timeless luminosity. They're not going to be able to relate to that or trust that right away, for sure. She said, but, you know, using uh, logic that opens their sort of, opens their wisdom mind, opens their insight, their prajna from inside. That's kind of essential because through prajna, they can, you know, be more and more fearless and touch into the uh, fearless kind of love uh, through prajna. So working with the understanding of interdependence, for example. Interdependence can open prajna. It can open insight from within the mind through contemplating, and studying, and meditating on interdependence. And then that can be a way to kind of open the wisdom mind, open prajna from inside, and then more and more fearlessness can come because they're relating more and more to the way things actually are rather than incorrect assumptions and superimpositions and con their own confused uh, ways of understanding what the nature of reality is. If you know the nature of reality, to the degree that you know the nature of reality is the degree the fear that can diminish. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really uh, important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she said, um, so they have to learn how to study what is the causes and conditions for appearances. What are the causes and conditions for one's own happiness, for one's own suffering? Everything's changing every single moment and exploring just the way things actually are, just exploring in a way that's in alignment with the way things are. That's the way to open the wisdom mind from, from within. And so, um, for example, uh, um, Shira <laughs> 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 Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the reason insight is so important is otherwise uh, there's no stability in these mm. qualities. So if you introduce a, a topic like love, compassion, yeah, of course they like it. I want to sign on to that. But there's no stability mm. because it's just dependent on 
current causes and conditions for them, for example, to connect with a, a love or loving perspective. But then the conditions change and it just vanishes into some, something else. So there's no stability. Mm. So how do you build stability in something like love or fearlessness or compassion? It has to be connected to insight and understanding and you know, through inter exploring interdependence and subtle impermanence and so on. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, she said, all these good qualities, there's many. Love is, of course, one, and then patience, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ethical discipline, you know, and uh, diligence. There's all of these really good, wonderful qualities, but none of them are stable because they're all initially dependent on causes and conditions. So, of course, you know, they're, they maybe can't trust it or feel afraid of it because they're not stable. Mm -hmm. And so the way towards stability in love or these other wholesome qualities is by connecting it to insight and understanding. Mm -hmm. Because when the insight and understanding comes, there can start to be something that doesn't change mm -hmm. underneath. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everything's changing. But they start to intuit or experience something that's not changing, then there's something that they can trust more. And then the fear starts to diminish more and more. So then they could have fearless love, for example, based on that wisdom. で、シェルプドチョンはだ、人気プドチョンはいる。メリー。サマカイバレ。シェルソワイヨワイ、サマ。ソワテワルカイドワ。ソワトニルカギマルマ。ソワテワディシェラプジ。トニルズサマのカリ
there's an important word called Puljajuma, uh, which is, uh, I would usually translate as exceptional. Maybe you find that in the dictionary. But she's using it. Yeah, sort of best or exceptional. But she's using it in a very specific and more profound way. She's using it in the sense of like limitless. And she clarified when she uses the word exceptional, um, compassion and exceptional insight, what she means by that is it cannot be broken or disturbed by other conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's universal, because whatever conditions it meets mm -hmm. in the world, in different contexts, mm -hmm. beliefs, or traditions, it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be disturbed, it cannot be overcome. So that's how she means this word mm -hmm. exceptional or mm -hmm. And it's, it's limitless. Mm -hmm. And everything else is limitless. So she said, what is an example of something that's or undefeatable? kind of unsurpassable, it's like having a mind that when it, it encounters suffering, it results in bliss. Hmm. If you can transform everything you experience from suffering into bliss, that is an undefeatable perspective. It's an undefeatable mind. How could you anything disturb that? Because whatever it encounters, it turns suffering into bliss. That's an example of what she means by <laughs> She said, set aside whatever you think you might be doing in your own mind with your own feelings. Imagine the capacity to encounter any kind of suffering and transform it into bliss. It, it ex is experienced in your mind as bliss. That's Pudu Jungwa. That's exceptional. ジャンプリンで風邪ちゃんもいな、チェジリ、ジュニアで投げちゃう。ドルチにたんずれやん。投げて。せめわれは。かにためどは。で、なじ、シラブジ。ゴーン、シラブジ。え、に、これに、
sort of, you know, this imaginary dialogue. Um, show us some kind of evidence of magic. You know, scientists might say, show us some magical display that proves, you know. And she said, that's also stupid. <laughs> you already show it all the time. You've produced something that can destroy the entire Earth. One hydrogen bomb, one atom bomb. You can turn, on, look at the screens we relate to, you can turn black to white, white to black and everything and create any image immediately from nothing and dissolve it into nothing. You have already done it. You're doing it all constantly. You don't need more magic than that. So she said, she's just sort of teasing, but getting the right causes and conditions together for a dialogue and meaningful dialogue and discussion and um, is really important and valuable and sharing, coming together, finding ways to bring peace and happiness into the world. That's what this should all be about. That's, and it is possible that, that that dialogue can lead to like methods or solutions that could bring more peace and happiness into the world, which of course is so important and, and, and the point of it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.